Hello and bienvenido San Antonio. Welcome to the Alamo Hour, discussing the people, places, and passion that make our city. My name is Justin Hill, a local attorney, a proud San Antonioan, and keeper of chickens and bees. On the Alamo Hour, you'll get to hear from the people that make San Antonio great and unique and the best kept secret in Texas. We're glad that you're here. All right, welcome to the Alamo Hour. Today's guest is Stefan Bowers of the Goodman Bowers Group in San Antonio. Uh, Stefan is first and foremost a chef, I think would be fair to say, right? Yep, I call right. myself. I don't want to call you an executive or one of those things. Yeah, you, I, you can call me chef. I'll okay. call myself a cook. <laughs> All right, there you go. Uh, not only that, he's he's a veteran, um, a prolific social media poster, um, which we'll get into in a little bit. And an, I think one of the more interesting things about you that sets you apart from whether you like it or not, you're a celebrity chef in this city, is you are less about the self-promotion than a lot of our celebrity chefs, and you're very big in promoting your industry to the sort of lowest level employee in the restaurant. And I think that sets you apart in a lot of ways in that you glorify and you celebrate everybody that's back in the kitchen as opposed to people that are glorifying themselves all the time. So right. I think that's an interesting part of your persona. And I think it's an important part of your persona. And it's, I like reading about it. And I know that you have a very loyal following, not only from people who love your food, but also people that work with you, it seems like. Right. Um, so we're, we're going to have you on to talk a little bit about the food industry. I don't want to belabor the point of what's going on with COVID. Everybody's talking about that sort of uh, ad infinitum, but we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'm going to blame you probably for me putting on about 15 pounds during the the, the, the shutdown due to your pizza. Right. I get the pizza a lot. Right. Um, I do this with everybody. I start, and I think you're going to have insights that a lot of people would want to know. Um, just some general questions about who you are in San Antonio. When and why did you end up in San Antonio? Okay. I ended up in San Antonio in 2005 um, via Houston. And I moved to Houston in 2003 to go to culinary school. Moved there blind. <laughs> Um, I was living in San Diego with my wife, and believe it or not, San Diego didn't have any culinary schools. Is that right? That's right. They had one in, La, I want to say, well, I don't want to say La Mesa, but yeah, there wasn't one anywhere local to where I, where I was, and I was living in Pacific Beach. So all of my wife's family is from Texas. She's got one of these cliched, giant Texas families. So she wanted to move back to be by family. So we moved to Houston, and then uh, I did school there. My wife got in two really bad car accidents while Jeez. we were in Houston. And um, after the second one, we wanted to get the hell out of there. <laughs> so it's time to go to San Antonio. And that was it. Moved here in 2005. So what um, what was the school in Houston? It's called the Elaine and Marie Lenoir Culinary School. So it was okay. a small French school, and that's why I picked it. And it only had financial aid for GI. Huh. Uh, it didn't have government financial aid at the time. So, of course, classroom size was tiny. So there was around three to five people in each class. Awesome. Even went down to around two people. All expat-type chefs that were there that were recruited or brought over from uh, France that were there, basically almost enslaved. Well, they were, they were paid very little, and they were held on in order to get their visas Okay. by Elaine Leneau. So they were kind of grumpy, underpaid, and very qualified. So and classic French training? Very classic. Did you All work in Houston any? Yeah, I worked in Houston. That was the where my springboard was. I worked in San Diego for a couple of Italian women, but my real the real first full service kitchen that I worked in on the line was at a place called the Sam Houston Hotel downtown. Okay, and that was a that was a at the time it had just relaunched their new restaurant seventeen, and the talent there was uh, was special. And everyone that's worked there that I know of that I worked around has gone on to very successful things today. That was a great place to start. So I lived in Houston for a little bit in 09, 10, 11 time. And Mark's was just about to close. And that was kind of the nicest place I ever ate in, uh, in Houston. Yeah. Mark's I've forgotten about Mark's. It was that old Aries, church. Aries and Mark's yeah, yeah. and those were. And DeMarco, right and DeMarco. down the street from, from mm -hmm. Mark's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you get into cooking? Um, it, I, looking back and at my childhood, I should have known that I wanted to be a cook. If I had sort of just a natural uh, penchant to just go into the kitchen and create. Okay. It was an easy way for me to um, sort of exercise creativity 
I was not good at drawing. I wasn't good at painting or, or any of that sort of thing. But it seemed like in the kitchen I could walk in there and I could just sort of throw things together. Um, as high school progressed and we cut school and smoked a lot of weed, we'd go into the kitchen and we'd start. I'd start to cook and I would just start to make stuff. Barbecue, steaks, whatever, milkshakes, anything, hamburgers, <laughs> what have you. Milkshakes. And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, milkshakes all the time. Yeah. Mint chip milkshakes, like nonstop. <laughs> so we did that. And then, you know, and then it didn't, it never materialized in my head that I should cook. No one ever suggested to me, you should maybe go into cooking. Yeah. So it wasn't until I was in the Navy that I realized once I had gotten married that I was did like to do the cooking. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you about sort of restaurants in a second, but are yeah. there any sort of off the beaten path, hidden gems in San Antonio you like? I've had people mention weird trails or historic homes. Are there any sort of things in San Antonio that you recommend, you know, out of town guests, hey, this isn't going to be in the guidebook? Restaurant wise, I'm gonna get there. Okay, touristy type spots. Touristy type spot. You know, I uh, my ashes are gonna be spread at Hardburger Park. Okay, right on the Savannah Trail. All right, that's my favorite place to be in the world in this city. I've walked that path countless times, and I walked it, and even through the you know they resurfaced it, but you know about five years back, that was heartbreaking to me because it was such a pure, simple three foot trail. Sure, and. Uh, that to me, you know, I take anyone in my family that comes here on that park and, and in the Oak Loop um, on that part, that trail. And it's very personal to me and, and I, I love it. So, so Savannah Trail is your trail there? The Savannah Loop okay. within Hardburgers, yeah, or the Oak Loop. I've never Loop. done it. Got to do it. I know, I need to. It's good, especially in the morning. Deer, plenty of, you know, plenty of rabbit, deer, plenty of uh, armadillo, just and peaceful. Okay. Quiet. That's where they're going to be putting the oh, the over uh, the land bri- bridge. The land okay. Bridge. Yeah. Okay. Now restaurants. Restaurants are always tough, you know, in terms of being asked where I like to eat because once I had kids, you know, the options really dropped off the table. <laughs> um, they were adventurous in the beginning, and and as they've gotten older, they've gotten less and less adventurous. Um, I eat at all the places that that most people do um you know i love like carnitas lone house for for lunch i think that's just you know one of the more solid places yeah. to get to have style. you been to loncheria del popo no i haven't been to these new so okay so i don't know if this i mean this is a strange place that has like three sandwiches they're like 225 and they come with a bag of lays chips it's on san pedro it's from laredo 50 years there but it's got just this weird cult following And I've got a confession to make over the last, like, of course it's, you know, I've got a horrible short term memory. Okay. It's terrible. So remembering names and remembering places and being, you know, having to kick out places on the spot never works out. I'm going to get my car. I'm going to remember 50 when I'm driving home. (laughs) But, but, um, something has happened. There has definitely been a sea change in San Antonio over the last year, I'd say where there's a lot of killer small places that I'm seeing, especially on, on social media. Yeah. So I am definitely the one that needs the inside on where to go (laughs) because there's so many, it's hard to stop and choose. With your social media following, I'm sure you could just ask and you would get thousands of recommendations. I do. I get, I do. I do get them. And then I just. (laughs) Well, Loncheria del Popo, even your kids would like, I think it's like a hamburger like a weenie burger. I mean, it's just this strange place that has this huge following that and you get a little fun. thing of, uh, pickles, uh, pickled peppers and onions, mm-hmm. like as part of the deal. That sounds great. Super simple menu. Uh-huh. Um, you were talking about the food, uh, sort of change you've seen over the last year. Um, how would you kind of describe the food change since you've been here? I mean, I moved here right after you, I moved here in 07 and back then there was kind of like two nice places to eat and then lots of chains, but it's, it's, it's been a right. quite a big progress for our city in terms of the culinary scene, right? Yeah. The first time that I, the first restaurant that I had introduced to me while I had first moved here and my brother-in-law was moving here was driving down I-10 and then pointing out Mama Margie's to me that that was an <laughs> option for me to get a job at. And I thought I was completely, I was like, I'm fucked. Yeah. I've done some, so I've done some research. I knew that Weissman was here. I knew that there was like four, there was the four guys at the top. There was Weissman, Auden, Mark Bliss, and, uh, Dady. And Dady. Yeah. But I didn't know about Dady. Okay. Um, he would have been young then. But it was, it was Weissman, Auden, Bliss, and Damien Wattel. 
Those oh, are kind of like, right. those yeah. are the godfathers of, of, you know, San Antonio fine dining, in my yeah. opinion, in this city. So I was, I was going to work for one of them when I was coming here. I wrote a letter to Andrew. I got no replies. So screw you, Weissman. I got, I did letters to all of them. I got replies, but they didn't have any jobs. And I mean that in jest, but, <laughs> um, but I did end up getting a job for Jeff Balfour at Valencia in 2005. And that's what it was. Cause okay. I had hotel experience, worked there for six months and, um, then discovered Dady in a little pamphlet and went out and, and literally tracked him down while he was building bin five, five, five okay. and got my job. When you moved here, did Damien have that monster complex thing no. they were building over there? No, Damien, that was after that. Damien was still in his, his almost location. This is two. I mean, 2005 Wiseman was just really ramping up to become, you know, just the, the, you know, the zenith that he was, you know, about to yeah. attain with the New York Times, about a year away from that New York Times article where he got, I think it was three stars. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then being on the banks was what it was. I never really inquired, what have you. But it's still just solid. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it, it's probably the same then as it was, as it is yeah. today, other than a few decor changes, but... <laughs> I don't yeah. think many decor changes. No. <laughs> Still a bunch of big dried gourds. I always look at those every time I come on there. Um, you told me one time, what is your favorite cookbook? So for anybody listening who wants to try their hand at cooking, what right. would you recommend? You recommended a Mediterranean cookbook, and I opened it up and thought, I don't know what the fuck any of this stuff is. I didn't even know the ingredients. Okay. Was it a, was it a, hmm. was it a person? Or was it a? If you said the name, I would remember. Generic, Mediterranean. Co- oh, it, was it a Sylvana Rowe cookbook or? A, uh, I say Mediterranean. There was just a lot of Mediterranean ingredients in I'm there. I'm sure there was. Yeah. So when Feast opened in 2011, I was. I feel like I was a little bit ahead of ahead of the game, and I was trying to bring something new into the city that hadn't been done. And so I really went deep into Eastern Med, okay. and <laughs> and uh, and basically, you know. Um, Gaza Strip style food okay. and, and brought a lot of those those you know North African flavors. So now it's commonplace to see harissa and you know mm-hmm. and all these things all over menus. But back then, I thought we were pretty much the only ones doing it on on a non ethnic based restaurant scale. But for a beginning cook, any books you recommend is the like Joy of Cooking. Okay, the best cookbook in the world is the That's Joy of Cooking. That's not the one you told me. You That's, told me one, and I remember thinking I, was I don't even know the ingredients. Still a snob at that time, and still really. <laughs> Cared about it. <laughs> so, but no, the joy of cooking. Okay. So your lamb lollipops over there, those, those had a lot of like Mediterranean flavors in them. Big time. Totally yeah. taken from, um, definitely re readapted, but taken from a Sylvania row recipe. Um, she's a, she's a chef out of uh, England and, but she's, um, I'm pos- I don't want to, I'll probably overstep myself here, but I feel like she's Hungarian. Okay. And she, she just had a, that's the direction I went. I bought all our cookbooks before we opened Feast, and I just studied anything I could that had Eastern Med flavors. So, uh, you know, uh, people get drunk and they talk about stupid shit, and one day we were sitting around talking about the best three things we've eaten in this city, and mine were lamb lollipops, your steak at Rebel right when y'all opened, and y'all yeah. had those duck confit potatoes that came with them, right? I'm so glad you remember those. Yeah. So good. That's badass that yeah. you remember those. Those and are the rooster potatoes that we had sourced out through Benny Key to make duck to make confit potatoes. Yeah. So those two things, and then the third was a. It was almost like a beef Wellington that that McHugh did right when cured open. It uh-huh. was it was fantastic. But yeah. you made two of the top. Thanks. And then I remember y'all were retiring the lamb lollipops, and I was very sad. But I wasn't sad yeah. to see cured. I mean, a feast go because that building seemed like it was about Road to fall hard down and put up wet, <laughs> and it smelled like it was put up wet sometimes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you have a feud going with Burger Boy, I see on on Facebook. Oh, a they faux got, feud. Yeah, a faux feud. A feud. <laughs> yeah. So they they got upset. Um, I think there's more of a deeper. Uh, there's d- an undercurrent going on between. They're very busy and during the pandemic. Fast foods boomed. Oh, they're they are long line right now. Boomed. Yeah. Everybody's it's easier. Obviously, it's safer feeling to go through a drive-through. Yeah. So th- I think they block the parking of people that are trying to you know that are at Little Death shopping and they can't get out. Ah. So there was the trad probably tried to be reasonable, whatever. And there's just a nothing we can do about it situation. So I don't know. One morning when we were doing our when we were doing our pop up, the guy was just out there and he was gesticulating at me, definitely as we were setting up and on his phone and what have you. And then the cop showed up at the end of the day. So 
and the cop came and said, there's nothing I could do. I was called because no one's wearing masks, but it's everybody sitting down eating. Yeah. Not You're wearing masks. To. Yeah. Also outdoors. Also outdoors. Yeah. yeah. So there he's, it's chill now. It's, nobody, there's no, nobody there's likes no having term. competition. And I'm not door. picking a fight with Burger yeah, Boy. I know, I know who, I know who, you know, I respect the, the, the hustle. You go sell a hundred and they sell a hundred every two hours minutes. probably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite thing to, to cook and what's your favorite thing to eat? Um, I would say my favorite thing to cook is, hmm, I love making Sunday night pasta. Okay. I love making a good, simple, but very long stewed, uh, like beef ragu with spaghetti. You post a lot of it. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. We we do usually we this has thrown things through a loop because it's Sunday night dinners every night. But back when it was really an important night, right before school started, we yeah. would sit down every night for sure and have pasta. Nice. Um, eating wise, I'm a I love hamburgers. Me too. Straight up. Yeah. I'm simple. I've always have been. My dad's taken me to all kinds of places growing up, so I just like a good burger. And, That's uh, my favorite thing to drink with wine or to eat with wine is, is like a, a cheeseburger yeah. and a good glass of wine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually had that as one of my questions. What do you think the secret is to a good hamburger? Me, smoke. I, I do grill, put mesquite wood in it, and just mm. smoke the hell out of them. That's my way of doing it. Um, to me, it's the... <sighs> It's that's that question's crazy because what you've got is is each category within side the from top to bottom bun. But oh, one true. thing that I feel that, you know, so the bun can ruin everything. True. Um the patty that has no flavor, that's too thick, can you know, the quality of meat. The, the, to me, the most important, the best burger I ever had in my life was at Zuni Grill in San Francisco. Okay. And it was as basic as it gets, but it was about an eight ounce per six ounce burger. It was kind of a thick guy. But the flavor of the meat was just beyond anything that I've ever tasted. I just never had tasted ground beef like this. So they're probably getting a real sustainable, really well made, cared for beef, and it was, it was unbelievable, in its flavor, in its simplicity. And you still remember it? I remember it like yesterday. So, um, but if but buns to me ruin burgers. Yeah. Um, that's why the bun we use it like uh, when we do them, we get a very small bun. Because to me, a burger is not a two-handed meal. I'm really, okay. I get real picky about it. Like, <laughs> burgers are fast food to the ultimate extreme to me. Sitting down, pulling up to your chair, your te your table, putting a napkin in and grabbing a burger with two hands and eating it is to me the most stupidest, <laughs> like, unnecessary eating action that you could occur. Burgers to me are something you have in one hand and you're filling out paperwork with the next or you're driving to a location or you're, you know... You're trying not to listen to somebody talk to you while you're enjoying eating So like it. White Castle size. Yep. I okay. love that. All right. Yeah. I love the, the, yeah. So, and I love, there's a lot of, I like the smash burger because what I like for the burger to be when you bite into it and eat it is you literally taste everything is in one yeah. big bite. So you get, you know, the different layers all come together into one. Not to be too pretentious about it, but you can taste a lot of burgers. How do you keep them from there. falling apart that thin though? Uh, the good beef. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it just, and, and they always contract. So we, they get, they get smashed super thin and then they, they, they contract on the griddle. Okay. They come well, I guess back. a griddle is different than a grill. Right. Yeah. Okay. There's no smash burgers on a grill. Okay. Yeah. And there's the, the grill burger is an amazing thing too. Yeah. What, the way, like Burger King used to be it for me. Like I was always <laughs> Burger King. Okay. So the flame. Yeah, and that's that's a funny story because that's what you asked me earlier how I knew when I was going to cook. I should have known when I was going to cook because in the second grade we went on a Burger King. Uh, we were going on a tour of the kitchen at Burger King, and it was a Burger King that I used to go to in Berkeley with my mom, and I was like literally it was Disneyland, and I was going to go to the back of the kitchen. They were going to show us everything. We get there, and they cancel the fucking tour on us, and I was <laughs> – irate devastated. and devastated <laughs> like truly as though christmas was canceled or something was canceled i couldn't believe i wasn't going to see where the magic happened so i love that charbroil flavor too um this one on here but that just brings up a point do, do you do any sort of outreach with like younger kids that want to get into to the kitchen and learn if that's their passion because i really never thought about it like you just said there are a lot of creatives who do not have 
drawing skills or, or, you know, writing or whatever those creative outlets are, but maybe that's their outlet and they've never got to try their hand at it. Do you do any involvement with that? I would love to. I don't think it's very popular anymore. Okay. Um, I'd love to see a kid. I even have like, you know, positions open at my restaurants that start at $14 an hour. Is that right? For not even, you don't even have to know how to cut an onion. You know, you just need to, I need to teach you how to cook a burger and fry a wing and we want to pay a wage that we know will pay your cell phone and get you parking or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's it's a li- partially livable wage, yeah. but they don't walk through the door. There's they're mm-hmm. just it's uh, I don't know. I, I I never I very 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 rarely have seen a young kid coming and saying, you know, I just want to cook. Um, do you but could a high school open? kid do y'all's hours? Sure. Okay. I mean, they could. I've got one high school kid working for me over at Rebel as a busser. Okay. But especially now. <laughs> True. They're all. <laughs> okay, so you moved here in 2005. You right. sent out a bunch of letters. You uh, ended up at. I ended up at, at uh, Citrus. Citrus, okay. Yeah. I was going to say Austin R, but. Valencia, yeah. Citrus. Uh, how long were you there? Six months. Okay. And then saw a little brochure that had a picture of a composition Jason Dady had. And it was the first time I ate a lot of, we went to a lot of nice restaurants in San Diego, but it was the first time that I went to a restaurant intent on hoping to get a job Hmm. at that restaurant. So I went there, I did his tasting menu. I spent like $250 of money. I absolutely did not have on my wife and I, and uh, then went back and was like, I got to work for this guy. You went there for the tasting menu to just get exposure to him? To see what it was that I was going to be working for. It was that when it was at Artisan's Alley or whatever that was called? No, that was at the Lodge. Okay. That was the Lodge at Castle Hills. All right. So did you? is that where you ended up working? I did. All right. Yep. I ended up working there for two, a little over two years. Ended All right. Becoming a sous chef. Two years at, at the Lodge, mm-hmm. and then you went to 29? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, there you were head chef? Yeah. The famous story is I got fired. Jason Dady shit canned me from the Lodge. <laughs> we just were too... I was very, very passionate and very over the top, and I just saw myself out, essentially. I was crazy back then. I very, read Kitchen Confidential. Dirty. It sounds like there's that's kind of a consistent uh, issue in, in, in high-end kitchens. Right. I don't want to be self-aggrandizing, but I was just very, very driven. Okay. And I was on like 60 to 90 milligrams of Adderall, <laughs> and so I was basically a speed freak okay. in the kitchen that also had the same, you know, would go to bed reading the French laundry every night and also in, you know, worked for, I, I kind of came out of that last bit of generation where people were very hardcore in the kitchen and there was, you know, it was not a softer kitchen when I was still working. I would get screamed at in the kitchens and um, I would push the guys around me, push them very hard. And uh, because that's how I would push myself. Sure. I was also even on Adderall, no Adderall, didn't matter. I just was, there was nothing that was going to, prevent me from moving up the ranks in the career I had chosen. It was, a, it was just a, it was war for me to climb the ladder. So coming out of classic French style um, school and then kind of having those aspirations, is your goal at that point to have a French laundry or some sort of high-end dining French restaurant? Was that sort of a, a long-term goal? No, because uh, Italian was always my first passion. Okay. Prior to going to, to moving to Texas, I had worked for two Italian ladies for a year for free doing a stage with them. I went and did, I worked lunches for them. I'd work from around 10 AM to 2 PM for them. Then I would jam over to the junior college, knock out a couple of classes. Then I come back and wait tables for them at night. Jeez. I went, um, I went broke working for them. I came out of Navy and just went broke working for them. Um, they were real shady the way they shared, did tip share. They <laughs> tip shared with themselves. They would okay. cut, take half your tips and give it back to the, themselves. And eventually I got, I just was running out of money. San Diego isn't cheap. And I had to get a job as a waiter until I moved out here. So, but at the same time, Italian cuisine, because it's so comprehensible and so pure, um, I was able to wrap my head around French is, I, I got the introduction to the Escoffier style of French cooking. Um, which means what? Which is just extremely ornate. Okay. Very detail oriented, multi-layered compositions that require unbelievable amounts of finite prep to achieve an end result. Okay. And it can get real, just, it can just become just too tedious. Yeah. Whereas you watch, you know, when I was in the Navy watching Mara Batali, 
you know, knock out three dishes on his show before he was disgraced, you know, and, and <laughs> I'll say, I don't know if we want to talk about him on the show brilliantly, just, you know, cooking on do you know, cooking three dishes from beginning to end in 30 minutes, no edits and the purity and the simplicity of his, of his comprehension really was attractive to me. So I went to the, I, even though I, I went to French culinary school because I wanted to learn the, you know, absolute technique. And I, and so I wanted to take technique and then of course, you know, what be it, how to make stock, how to make fawns, yeah. how to make, you know, the knife cuts, anything like that, butchering. Um, I did that to go, I went to culinary school for that and are, it was worth it. Are there Italian cooking schools specific for that? Um, there's a Piscius in, in, um, in Rome, um, over there though. Yeah. Over there. There's Most culinary schools are French style cooking schools, right? Yes. Because okay. they, because the French have mastered the fundamentals. Okay. Um, and I always think Italian food's a lot more comfort food. I mean, it just, For sure. yeah. It's more I, on my level. I did get lucky to go to French laundry one time and, and you know, it was impossible to get into. we got on a wait list, we get in and it was great. I mean, but Mm -hmm. lots of, uh, a little overblown, I thought. Right. And crazy expensive. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it was pretty cool afterwards. They took us back, got to meet all the chefs and I mean, they do a, it's a full, um, you know, display when you go there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you stayed at 29 for three years, three and a half years. Yeah. And then since then is when you and Andrew got together and Mm -hmm. Andrew went and dined at 29 and and kind of, um, I went, was on his radar and he was getting out of his industry of the scent business and wanted, just wanted to figure out, he had had the split in a relationship and he wanted to just figure out what to do with the rest of, uh, his life basically. So y'all open up feast. Yeah. Did you just generally have free reign on the menu there? It was collaborative. We, okay. I wanted to make sure we had a restaurant that of food. I've always wanted to put food on the menu that he likes. Yeah. Um, and that we both like, and Andrew also has a very. Andrew is more of a diner than he is a, a than he is um, a businessman. I'd say even yeah. he's he he knows what he likes when he eats out. He eats out pretty much every meal every day of his life, so he's definitely more um, in tune with with what people like. And I also I know I mean there are things that I want to cook that I know a lot of people don't aren't interested in, but I also want to run a business first. Right, it's at the end of the day. So you know I hate running a business. It it's, a, it's the hard part of it. It's there's no passion about it, you, but you have to right. do it, and it takes up a ton of time. H- how long was Front uh, Feast going before y'all started Rebel? Um, Rebel started in twenty late twenty fifteen, so about five years. Okay, because I was. It seemed like y'all had a long run at Feast, and we then did. Rebel Battalion Playland all came pretty quick thereafter. Yeah, that was that was a little too. Yeah, that was fast. H- how do you sort of? I guess this is the question, right? How do you even attempt to maintain? the quality that your food is when you grow at that kind of speed? Well, luckily at Battalion, I've got Zeke there. Zeke has been with me since 29. Oh, wow. I've worked with Zeke actually all the way back. I pulled Zeke from the lodge after I got fired. He was, came with me. I gave him an opportunity to be sous chef for me at 29. So I've worked with Zeke's for on and on for about 14 years. Wow. So Zeke understands. Um, He's grown a lot. The other ones, um, let's say, you know, Rebel, Rebel was very shaky for a period of time. It had, a, and now I got a guy in there who's been there since day one and he can, him and I are on the same page and he knows flavor and he, he does it. He does it right. Playland has been the toughest. The bottom line is pizza is far more difficult than frying mm-hmm. fish, searing meat or doing anything. Is that else. right? Wood burning cooking is 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 makes all the others look like a joke because it's a true craft. Okay. You can take a, the most fine dining chef out there and stick him on a pizza station with a wood burning oven and he won't have a clue what to do. So it's really caused me to have a really difficult time finding people. And, and then, of course, you have the fine dining guy. If he sucks at it, thinks, I don't really like pizza. <laughs> he can't find the poetry in yeah. it. Yeah. So... It's so what you got to do is you got to find somebody who's not, who just likes to work with their hands, likes repetition and likes the nuance of working with fire. And I finally have gotten that it's taken over two years. I finally have that there. Um, but there's a lot of work 
on the managerial side that these guys need. They're not very good managers. They're not very good kitchen overseers. They're not uh, good. They don't have great, or we try to put systems in place and, you know, I'm just trying to get them out of bed sometimes. <laughs> so, but they can make <laughs> freaking consistent pizzas. Sure. So it's, it's, it's tough. So, but consistency wise, um, I wouldn't do it over again. I would not open up four separate concepts yeah. um, that are completely different from one another um, because you just can't be, you just can't, you can't oversee them right. all at once. Right. You simply can't. Especially at that high level. Right. I mean, if right. you're, you know, pumping out tacos maybe, but. Exactly. Yeah. This is high stakes level and there's a lot of stress and, and you know, it's just no. So I kind of talked about this at the start. You give a lot of credit to others in what you do. Um, and I always, you know, from every restaurant I think you've been at, but let's just talk about Playland. I, I mean, from the time y'all have opened and your love of that damn oven mm -hmm. to um, I think after that, we there was a bunch on tomatoes, then a bunch on peppers. Uh, the, you know, coup de gras was your flour that you found out of Austin that you yeah. said was sort of the flour. Um, what is sort of your philosophy on, on every single element has to, you know, I guess it has to reach what you think is the proper level of quality right. to put it together. How do you go about that? Well, you first come to this conclusion that you're never going to make any money by <laughs> liking everything that's nice. Okay. <laughs> that is high quality. All right. Or you're going to struggle or you better charge, which I'm just learning how to do. But, um, you know, the, 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 if you give a damn, the product speaks to you. So, and so does the work of the people that do it. You're talking about the tomatoes and the peppers. Um, the, that you're talking about Linda and Larry Starnes mm -hmm. who are out of BB, Texas that are both in their seventies mm. and work in this weather that we can't be out in for more than 15 minutes at a time yeah. during the day, um, to create a bounty of, of this incredible produce. Um, it's a story in itself. And the reason why I highlight these things so much, and you talked about earlier about how, you know, I become, uh, you know, passionate about these sort of the, the, the more blue collar, you know, nature of this business yeah. is because that's what, that's where the, the real poetry of this business lies. That's where, and that's what's so overlooked. Um, and not to romanticize it because that's boring, but you, you know, the fact that there hasn't been a story done on Linda and Larry Starnes and what they, they're doing by any national magazine or any of this thing just shows how much, you know, the lens, it's just so wide. It can't see anything. Right. You know, yeah, it's, if it's, if it's hot and it's in Nashville or it's in Austin or if it's what have you, yeah, they'll focus that lens down in on there and get it, get that story mm -hmm. because it's going to be, it's going to get some clicks. But I feel like it's my duty to, to do the best I can, whether it's through writing about it, you know, or discussing it or be and trying to be as, as literal as I can about the work. So let's just take Larry and Linda, for example, yeah. what makes them different? Is it, is it the sort of diversity of what they're growing? Is it the time they put into it? Is it all of the above? What makes their all product the different? First off, she's growing. It's all of the above. First off, the, she's growing an array of peppers that no one else is growing in United, in, in Texas. Okay. No, she, you know, it used to be too many strains, like 25 <laughs> different strains. Um, two, they're both in their 70s. It's brutal weather over in yeah. BB. Um, the environment's brutal. But... She's tenacious and works. Nothing breaks them. And Larry's tougher than, you know, than steel. And he's just, he's right there and just doing the heavy lifting for her. And they just refuse to quit. Where is BB, Texas? BB, Texas is about 15 miles uh, southeast of Sutherland Springs. Oh, okay. Southeast. Okay. So kind of heading towards Victoria. Yeah, okay. right, right in that zone, right in that that sandy soil area. Of, so, of, of, how did you get to know them? I saw them in a farmers market um, in Bernie Stage Farmers Market. I was shopping, okay. and she had about twenty five different dried varieties of chilies out on her on her table, and with about four packets e each. And I said, "I'll take them all." 
and, and that so was the, it. That was it. And so Larry came up to me, and Larry doesn't ever talk. Larry is a man of almost zero words. He used to be a high school football coach out in Gonzales, and uh, he never talked. And he came up to me and he just said, you know, who are you? What, what's going on? Why did you buy all those peppers? And I said, well, I'm just going to use them at the restaurant. And I came back the next week, and she had a little fresh and dry and stuff, and I bought her out. And then the relationship blossomed out. It's been about f- almost five years since the beginning of Rebel almost. And uh, now she just directly sells to us, but she also sells to Clementine and to uh, Botica okay. and uh, numerous other restaurants now. And I've tried my best to get um, uh, people involved with her, um, but a lot of chefs just like to fuck around and diddly with her, and, and she doesn't want to do that. She's not going to drive all the way out for $35 in sales or whatever. You. Right. So is that sort of... Uh, Kind of a good example of how you go about all your ingredients then? Um, you've got, I do, I, I'm, you know, it depends. Seafood, you're at the, you're at the mercy of, you know, sure. of the market. Beef, somewhat's the same. Um, it's hard to stay consistent if you're doing high volume and working with small growers. Um, but that's changing with Dean and Peeler. They're really starting to mm-hmm. put out a lot of stuff and quantity of it, of yeah. quality. Um, produce to me is the most important thing. Uh, but it takes a lot of time and effort to, to, uh, lasso it all up. And so grandma really took a big weight off our shoulders doing that. And then, you know, we, we just, if it's olive oil, we try to get the best we can afford. If it's just, we're always trying to just find the best pizza is another thing. We try to bring in, you know, the best mozzarella's that we can find and the best pepperoni. We used to use Barton Springs Mills flour. Unfortunately, we just, they got too expensive. We uh, just couldn't even handle the price. Is that right? For yeah. flour? Yeah, for flour. He was, you know, his music, he was up there in, in his flowers. So um, we were spending, you know, an insanely larger amount of money per week than we would have if we, and the huh. problem is, is that we're just not in a market where people give a shit. Yeah. And uh, I wish I could, you know, I, we're not the best marketers in talking about what we do, but I just couldn't, you know, I had to sacrifice one thing. Well, and that also, st- y'all started using them right before the pandemic too, right? Pretty much about four or five months, three or four months before. We did stop pre-pandemic, but uh, Playland's just always been a, a complicated uh, market to to hit. One, the name doesn't reckon, doesn't signify. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know, so it's. But the bumper car in there, you the know, that kind of gets it across. Right. I've, yeah. yeah, I've always said it could, you know, you never know what. But we've gotten, we've gotten little by little, the pandemic's actually been good for Playland in the sense that it's opened up a broader audience of locals. Um, but, you know, tourism is hard to nail down there. It's just, there's no parking. So it's been a oh, tough, yeah. it's been a tough, it's been a tough, uh, a tough ride there. We, uh, we slept down probably about once every other week. That's the one place we'll go and grab something down yeah. there. And your pizza's great. Um, you kind of had a famous letter in June of this year that got a bunch of attention, sort of the struggles of the restaurant scene in San Antonio with the COVID. Um, you did a question and answer with Sutter, I think is right. who it was. Um, I think one of the things that people don't realize is that when y'all shut down, all of that inventory gets tossed, right, yep. for the most part. And so when you reopen, you've got to restock all that inventory, and it's just a huge expense. Fair? Fair. That's that's it. We did it. We, we divvied it out to all of our staff. Okay. That's what we did. And we did that at Rebel. That was a sour memory for me. I mean, it was good seeing it, but watching Rebel get completely picked over of all the things that were going to perish by the staff when we were mm-hmm. closing it down. And I was sitting there and the table that looks right into the kitchen was just a, I mean, I'm glad the food's not going to waste. Right. But it hurt. So how are things, we are past the shutdown. I think we're at yeah. 75% allowance now, but that doesn't really speak to the realities of the industry. How are things going with y'all's restaurants now? Um, considering none of our restaurants are fast food, I wouldn't say, I would say Playland is not hot. It require it relies obviously on downtown business. Yeah. Locals are not going to pay $20 Cosa to freaking eat a pizza that costs 18. Yeah. Um, to park, you mean? Yeah. 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 So um, Rebel is doing fantastic. Rebel is, is that is, right? Yes, for what it's worth, for it being at a fifty percent mandate, I guess it's seventy five percent now. But being at the fifty percent mandate, um, Rebel is doing amazing. People are going balls to the wall in terms of ordering, huh. and 
we have just sort of over the last year when we switched over to seafood, we really just pulled the brakes off and just started doing things that were taking big risks and having like lots of lob, fresh lobster, uh, crab legs, um, just over the top items. And people love over the top <laughs> items and they love to take over the top items and add them with other stuff like beef with crab legs, with lobster, with shrimp and scallops. And so we've seen this sort of, uh, I don't know what it, it's, it's amazing and I'm, I'm enjoying every second of it, but people have expendable income and they're spending it at rebel. And it's basically, we do about 30 to 35% of birthday parties. People mm. are, are doing their birthdays or yeah. special occasions there. So they're prepared to go, to go all in. Huh. And so rebel is doing good. Great. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm very excited about it and yeah, I'm putting everything I can into it. Is it locals? Is it tourists? Is it business travelers? It's all, it's yeah? everything. Okay. It's, it's the whole gamut. It's just, it's everyone. It's like I, I just made that little birthday cake for all that from, you know, and posted it that I'm doing for everybody because there are so many birthdays there. Yeah. It's really gaining a reputation and it's going beyond the, the, I don't know, the boundaries that it had before where it was really just more the travelers and a, a couple people in the know or people that were very gour like gourmet food. Or yeah. I did a birthday there one time. I'll have to tell you about it off the air, but, oh, uh, fuck. Uh, as we were leaving, Andrew showed up and was like, well, y'all don't go. If, if, if y'all will hang out, I'll give you some free wine. And Andrew doesn't give free anything. So uh, it was uh -oh. going to be one of those nights. It was a great time. Is is uh, Battalion open? Battalion opens October 6th. Okay. I thought They're so. going to give it a roll of the dice. Okay. And now let's talk about what you've been doing. Um, I mean, I looked on Facebook today and there was something about sodomizing your dad. <laughs> and this is the marketing for your hamburger pop-ups that are going on. And... Uh, your dad is in quotations because it was a t-shirt. We're not actually talking about somebody's actual father. Um, you were doing... That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to Yeah. I'm going to look you right now. You know, <laughs> that's right. I have to actually mark on these episodes if they're explicit or not. So I, I, I try to never have to mark yes. So I put that in there. So uh, okay. I know. This is definitely going into the... Well, you know, yeah. we'll see. They've never said anything to me. Um, you started selling burgers at Playland at some point and calling them pumpers. Yes. Okay. Why? Okay, because, okay, so in the Navy, when I was in the Navy from, from 96 to 2001, and I wish I had the little, uh, so this is a soundboard, I wish I had in the Navy by uh, the village people right. to play right when oh, you said that, but I don't. I've got enough village people in my life right now. <laughs> um, okay, so, so in the Navy, when you're, when you're in a helicopter, when you land and you keep the, the prop going, it's, it's called a hot pump. Okay. So a cold pump is when you refuel and with, with the prop off and a hot pump is when you refuel with the prop spinning. Okay. So, so I was kind of, we were looking at a property that was a gas station and I wanted to call the gas station. Um, I want to say it was, um, the pump room. Okay. Because I was looking, what's a cool name for a gas station. So it was the pump room. So then that fell through and, I was like, I've got this burger idea I'm thinking about. I need a name for it that's not boring, what have you. But I hate eating burgers two-handed. I like burgers to be fast. So it came into my mind, you know, of a hot pump. And I was like, I can't call them hot pumps. That makes no sense. That's just too, yeah. too much innuendo there. So pumpers was where it came from. I just, it kind of was just, it's this mishmash of different ideas. And so I like the name pumpers. I also know there's a ton of play on words that you can do with it. Mm -hmm. um, you also, you know, they kind of fall into the context of burgers. You just pump, pump them out and just eat them and just knock whatever it is. <laughs> so, you know. And this then, is not a good, like, I thought there would be some grand answer to this. No. It's, no, it's that's just it. a mix mash of shit. It's a mix mash of shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it makes perfect sense. And that's usually, you know, it's, it's, so it also has something that has to be interesting. Instead of saying like, you know, hot dad's burgers or, you know, mm -hmm. these stupid shit. You were like, you know, dad burger, you know, whatever it is. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, you know, this sounds original. It's coming out from, from left field and, and I'm, I'm into it. And then, you know, just was hot dad's burger Andrew's idea for the name of it. No, it's just the first thing that came to mm -hmm. mind. I just, I just, there's, I always hear dad, all the kids say dad now. True. They always say, what's up dad to me every single, you know? And so I'm just like, okay. So, um, but the sodomy, let's just, that, okay, so let's clear the record here. So it's actually a really cool story behind that, and it was a tattoo. 
that I saw from a girl who that does all my art for pumpers that she'd taken and gotten a picture of from a former police officer that shared it with her that used to take pictures of tramps that would hang out at Travis Park and stuff. Okay. So so that would be if they ever found him dead, how they would identify him. No joke. Yeah, that's how they you know they do it. Story so, just took a turn for the dark. So so I saw, but I saw the uh, the 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 tattoo and I looked at it and it just it just just you know it manifested every emotion that I feel. <laughs> Not pumping your dad. But just you know, just the 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 Spartan hat, the wearing. Oh, that's right. Finger giving, yeah. you know, dude. You can see this tattoo on his Facebook if you go yeah. check it out, and you yeah. can buy the shirt on my website too. Oh, okay, yeah, all yeah, right. The shirts are available. Chad Carey liked the shirt so much that he printed them out just without even really. He 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 even just he just printed them out. He just couldn't wait. He was wearing it yesterday. So I don't really know Chad. I mean, I've met him before, but right when his bar opened, I was meeting a buddy there and I was on the phone. There's nobody there. <laughs> and people were like, where are you? And I was calling some people to come meet me. And I just kept being, you know, that death bar, death bar. And he, I think he corrected me three times. And then I just kept saying it because I couldn't tell if it was annoying him. And when I left, he was like, maybe I'll rename it death bar. I, <laughs> that sounds like Chad. Yeah. I couldn't remember yeah. what the name was. So, yeah. So that's, so it's, we're, the thing with pumpers is we're looking at it more. We do want to go more into like this this clothing aspect of it and sort of the fashion aspect, which is just again a disruptor of ideas in terms yeah. of food. People don't put the two together. Right. So Michelle Dobbs' art to me is brilliant. It reminds me of Art Crumb from the comic books Weird Weirdo back in the day that okay. my dad used to have, and uh, she's a phenomenal artist. And it's got a real eighties feel to it. Yes, it like does. Max headroomy kind of feel yep, to some it of sure it. Does. Yeah. And yeah. that's was, that was, that was uh, Robert Crumb's heyday in the eighties. Okay. So, um, you know, he's still, he's world renowned. And, and so her art is just, it's, it's very, it's 100% spawns from her own imagination. And, uh, and so that's, it's disruptive. It's not boring. And after, you know, you know, you have to tow one line for commercial style restaurants, but Pumpers doesn't have to play by any rules. Right. I, you know, I'm speaking out of turn cause I don't know, but it seems like it has created a rallying cry or a rallying point for industry people who have all kind of been, I mean, people aren't working together like right. they used to, and they're not getting together at bars after all the restaurants shut down anymore. And it seems right. like this has been a place for people to come back together and catch up and see each other and, kind of just get outside of this shutdown and pandemic, what y'all right. are doing. Yeah. What it is, is it's essentially, I hope if it does one thing, it shows how easy it is to live your dream. If you, most guys, most cooks, myself included, do not come from money, do not have the capital, uh, you know, backing to open a restaurant, but they have a passion for something that they're interested in. Right. So this proves and shows that with a minimal capital investment, you're capable of starting, you know, the, the little American dream still exists within cooking in, in regards to if you're going to be serious about it, you know, you do have to take it seriously. You have to be crafty and you have to be, you know, efficient and you still have to have an amazing product. Right. Pumpers isn't shit food with, you know, just for the sake of being funny and being clever. It really is an amazing burger. And, um, but it's, if it's anything, this pandemic has shown that people, you know, and that's what it showed me that restaurants are somewhat flat footed and with yeah. the pandemic, uh, you know, has proven that they can be blown over without even, you know, what's next. And it's always been this way in the restaurant. What's the hurricane coming? That's causing the restaurant to be slow. Yeah. Is it icing outside? Is the stock market crashed? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just was, is Ebola coming? Is it, you know, it's always something that's so it's better to be but people nimble. always want to eat. If you can change with the people, right. it seems like there's always a market for it. It's just whether your market matches whatever fear or That's economics it. or right. whatever are going on at the time. And That's just it. for people that don't know, you've taken the Pumpers concept off the Playland menu. It's still on the I Playland have. menu, but you are also doing these pop-ups on right. Sundays at Little Death on the Strip. Right. And it's kind of become this party yeah, it was fun. It's it gets a small crowd. There's around 30, 40 people there, 30 people there, and they're sitting at the picnic benches outside of Little Death. Um, there was a massive, horrible line. The first, of course, there's always FOMO, and the first, yeah, first day we did it was just 
ridiculous, but now it just is a nice, smooth, you know, um, 125, 150 burgers for right now going out in a day, which is easy for us. And, uh, and it's pleasant. It's one day a week that it also buys me one day a week where I'm able to, um, truly, I feel like experience cooking at its purest form. Yeah. No one calls in sick on me, you know, dishwasher machine doesn't break. Uh, there's nothing, you know, there's no, you know, whatever it may be. So it's there's just not protest downtown that blocked the door. Protest is not, you know, it's just, it's just, there's no inner, inner, you know, working fights that always are occurring. You know, there's always stress and where restaurants are just always filled with these stress markers throughout the day, like any profession. Um, but the one difference between restaurant profession and majority of other professions is that they have an immediate result on the customer. Yeah. That's the problem. The customer is immediate and they don't have a clue of what's going on. So that, that in itself causes just a massive stress buildup that you can't explain or rationalize to the guest. Listen, this is what's happening. They don't care. Yeah. Not interested. You're open, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Feed me. Yeah. You know, right. I, I never really, so I grew up in a very small town in North Texas. I moved here in 2007 um, football coach, dad, school teacher, mom. And so leisure eating was not a thing. I mean, right. you know, if we got to go out to, I mean, we didn't go to red lobster even or olive garden. Like right. if we went out and ate fried catfish, it was a big night out. Um, but it wasn't until I got here and it's such like a familial get together in a lot of restaurants. And I think feast brunch had that there are certain restaurants you go out and it's, yeah, you're there to eat and you're there to get to know each other. And it's the process of it it's the slowly maybe having a few too many drinks and definitely, you know, I never ran into that before and yeah. you have that here. And I think even in like the pop-up situation, mm -hmm. you know, people show up and they're eating burgers and then they have a little bit of wine and they see friends they haven't seen in a while. Yeah. I think it's great because there is nothing to do that anymore. I mean, we go out and we sit outside, at, you know, whatever restaurant we're at and we want to make sure that other table's far enough away from us. Cause you right. are avoiding the thing that I loved about going out and having food here for so long. Exactly. That was Andrew Goodman's biggest skill set. Andrew knew how to lay out a dining room. And he, when, you know, when we opened Feast, uh, the patio was in the back. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, this is a great patio in the, the area in the back. And he's like, absolutely not. We're going to do it in the front where people can be seen. Yeah. You want to be seen. Um, you want to be communal. And as you've, many people have partied with him, you know, while at his own restaurants and what have you, he loves that party mentality going off yeah. in his restaurants. And, uh, yeah, it's sorely missed right now. That that can that just you know, never knowing what could happen or who you'll see or, you know, how large the party will grow. So And Pumper seems to be kind of maybe not filling that void, but as close as we can get in light of what we have going on right now. Yeah. There's buzz about food again as yeah. opposed to the buzz of how do we help our restaurants that are starving right now. Right. I mean it's a it's a different kind of mentality and it's yeah, it's in, in luckily they're all they're all fun restaurants. I think to the aesthetically they they you know, it gets pretty lively over at Rebel. It gets really lively at Playland late at night. So yeah. we, since so when all the bars shut down, it became kind of like this late night thing. Of course it's, you know, kind of we're taking it with a grain of salt because it's a little distressing sometimes how you know, we had to hire a person to run the door and everything because we're trying still? to keep things safe. Yeah, even still. Jeez. Just to keep people, because people, you know, they just, it doesn't matter whether it's a restaurant or bar, if you're not enforcing these, you know, yeah. distancing mandates and everything, they will break them. Yeah. Um, so right now, y'all's group has Playland up and running. Right. What, what days is it open? Uh, it is open Wednesday through Saturday right now. Just basically... Five to nine on Wednesday, Thursday, and then goes five to midnight on uh, Friday, Saturday. Is it doing delivery still with Slice? It is. Right, I'm outside the coverage yeah. area. Yeah. Um, Rebel is open. Rebel's wide open seven yeah. days a week. Oh, is it really? Mm -hmm. uh, Battalion opens when? October 6th. Tuesday, October 6th. Is that all of them? Because Feast is That's it. gone Feast forever. Is, Feast is... Rest in peace. And then Pumper's Sunday at Little Death. Is is this just going to keep going on Sundays for the you yes. know, foreseeable future? Yes. Right. I've I've uh, got a plan. I want to do I want to do a year's worth of pop ups on okay. Pumper's so that I can understand the product and understand just the methods and uh, and just keep having a good time. Does Chad run any wine specials with the burgers? 
not in particular, but he's just got a lot of reasonable wines there. Yeah. You can, I mean, there's a, there, I don't think there's a more, um, diverse and, and, you know, it's very diverse. Like I've yeah. never heard of a single wine there. Every Absolutely. Time I go. He's bringing in these <laughs> wines that are made by, if you want, if you want to get into wine, you just have to talk to Chad because yeah. I've never seen anybody more passionate and more, you know, goes into like deep nerdville of, yeah. of wine. I mean, he's, he's, he's just, it mean he, he looks at wine. Like I look at a vegetable and he knows the growers and their stories and, you know, and there are all these really cool dudes that are out in France that are just really just going against the grain and trying to just bring out natural cool. wines. I went there. Uh, I, I went to Spain this November, and I came back, and Texas was having a Cidra Cider Fest. Mm-hmm. And I was like, cool, is there any? And there was a website, and you could find what restaurants are participating. And in San Antonio, only Little Death. So I go there, and I'm like, hey, you know, what's mm-hmm. the cider? And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, y'all are on this list. Uh do you know about the list? Do you know about the list? I don't know about the list. So that was my uh, cider. <laughs> yeah, never foray expect, into little death. <laughs> uh, yeah, ja- they were on the website though. Yeah, he's he's always he's gonna do his he's gonna do his thing. Um, okay, so I always end these with me saying who my guest wish lists are. You as a restaurateur have met yeah. some fascinating people in San Antonio. Yeah. Anybody you recommend that I that I that I should try to get on the show and talk about whatever they're passionate about. And we're everything. We're just a San Antonio kind of focus thing. I mean, Pop is always my uh, forever and ever cross my heart wish list, and I'm sure he'll never do this. But I'll I'll throw it out there to him when I see him. He'll laugh at me. <laughs> see if I can pull some pull a favor for you. I've never asked anything of him. Um, someone to get on the show. Anybody you run into and you're just like, they, that guy's got interesting stories. Like Hardburger, I want to get on that dude. I don't know if you've had David Adelman on here, Mm-mm. but he's, I love his, his style and he's, he's just, he's just such a savvy. Um, he owns a lot of properties, right? Yeah, yeah. He's just a savvy businessman and he's been a great partner to work with okay. uh, over at Playland and super supportive, but just also cool as, as, you know, as, as the day is, he's just so smooth and cool and great to work with, as well as uh, his architect, Luis Miguel. Okay. He's also a young, enterprising guy who's brilliant. Yeah. And uh, they put up that 68 building, and they did uh. the Burns building, and they have properties all over the place, but they sort of fly under the radar when, in reality, um, they're really moving the needle in this city. Okay. Well, that's a good, you know, uh, I had a random guy back here one day who was like, I work for David Adelman, and he was asking me questions, and I remember, that's why I looked up who David Adelman was. Yeah. yeah. Cool dude. And okay. uh, just always, always idea driven. All right. Uh, do they own the building y'all are in? Yes. Uh, okay. All they right. do. They um, do. We own a lot of rent, so I'm trying to plug it right now. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm kidding. But but at the same time, I mean, it's hard right to come out right off the top of my head. But um, with with people, but um, so does Pumpers have a website where people can buy the the swag and all that stuff? Yes, it does. But be very careful when you put it in. It's pumpers dot world, not pumpers world. Okay, because if you go to pumpers world, you know you may have those issues, but you're not going to want to. You know, you may get fired from your job, is yeah, what you're saying. Yeah, you might. Well, they'll actually feel sorry for you, but <laughs> I think it's a reptile dysfunction website. <laughs> Penis pump. Awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> pumpers dot world, and you can find the, the merchandise. It's a terrible website. It's got absolutely no graphics. But at you can all. buy your uh but you can buy your shirts sh- and yeah, stuff. You can buy shirts and all right. Uh, and you know. and then you can stop by Little Death on Sundays starting at noon until y'all sell out to buy, buy a shirts. pumper, yep. buy wine, buy a shirt. Totally. All right, Have Stephen. A good time. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks um, for having we're me. We're gonna fun. come out um probably this Sunday and buy some. I wanted the, the crowd yeah. to die down. Okay. Well I don't know when this is gonna bring you to prep put it out, but we are closed. Zeke's out of town, so we're all yeah. taking a nap this Sunday. And we'll be back at it October 4th. Okay. So this will be the October 4th show, actually. It'll be that week before. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Alamo Hour. Stefan, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. That was fun. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Alamo Hour. You are all what make this city so great. We hope you join us next week. In the meantime, subscribe to our podcast. Check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Alamo Hour or our website, alamohour.com. Until next time, Viva San Antonio!